Welcome back. I hope you've had a chance to take a read of Flannery O'Connor's short story, the, the Enduring Chill. We're going to unpack the story a little bit because there is a deeply pneumatological theme and dynamic that makes the story so brilliant. So let's take a look first at who is Flannery O'Connor, and then we will look at the story itself. Flannery O'Connor is considered one of the greatest literary figures in recent U.S. literary history. She's one of the greatest story writers in the 20th century. Born on March 25th in 1925 in Savannah, Georgia, uh, she grew up in the South, and this colors her writing and the themes that she explores and what her interests are. She was born into a Roman Catholic family and was devoutly uh, very religious, and she delves into religious themes in the most implicit way unexpectedly. Early on, Flannery demonstrated real literary talent. She studied at what is now the University of Iowa, where she obtained her master's degree. Her first short story, called The Geranium, was published in 1946. She also began her first novel, A Wise Blood, and that was published in 1952. Even while she was very young, still growing up, she faced many hardships. She lost her father when she, she was only a teenager. He died of lupus, and that was the same disease which Flannery O'Connor would later be diagnosed, would suffer, and would su succumb to. So she was diagnosed with lupus in 1951, and she died of it a mere 13 years later at the age of 39. So a very short life, but she apparently lived it very well. She wrote so much. She has a total of two novels and 32 short stories with numerous other commentaries and publications. She's received many literary awards, even posthumously. Uh, she was given the U.S. National Book Award for Fiction in 1972. Here are some of the major themes of Flannery O'Connor's writings. Her stories reflect the decaying South and the tensions of racial relations of her day. Remember, she's living in the 1950s, and in 1954 was when we had Brown versus Board of Education, that landmark decision from the U.S. Supreme Court, which deemed um, Plessy versus Ferguson unconstitutional and desegregated the public schools. Flannery O'Connor is a woman of faith, and so many of her stories, at the heart of them, contain religious values and a deep spirituality. She explores the dynamics of guilt and sin, good versus evil, and how transformation can happen through the working of grace. She does this in a very peculiar way. She's known for a grotesque literary style. She introduces the almost brutality of grace changing a person. And this is not grace destroying nature, but rather grace building on human nature, bringing, healing it from its wounds and bringing it to the heights of what God calls us to be. So she has a very deeply sacramental approach, which is very Christian, very Catholic. She views the world in all of its brokenness, but also in its sacramental value, seeing how the created world is charged with the grandeur of God. And that's, that's what Gerard Manley Hopkins will say, um, Jesuit poet that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Everything that we see around us, God created, and he created good. Sometimes we've distorted the good of God's creation, but nonetheless, it can reveal to us something deeper, something more about the goodness of God. So O'Connor's fiction is not apologetic. Her depictions are rather bizarre sometimes, and it's through experiencing the grotesqueness of the story often about deceptively backward Southern characters and following how they undergo transformation that we too are invited into this sacramental point of view. And this is what you'll see or have seen in the story Enduring Chill. So however grotesque the setting is or the story is, Flannery portrays her characters as being opened to the touch of God to divine grace transforming them. And as I said earlier, it's very often that some element of violence which they experience enables the breaking forth of grace in their lives. 
So she has been quoted to say, quote, grace changes us and the change is painful, end quote. So indeed, um, in order to be transformed, to be saved, to be made holy, grace can achieve that within us. But when it does, do expect it to be painful because we are renouncing, we're dying to our sinful selves in order to take on a new life in grace and in Christ. Here's a quotation from something she's written reflecting on her own writings. She says, I have to see grace caring enough awe and mystery to jar the reader into some kind of emotional recognition of its significance. To this end, I have to bend the whole novel, its language, its structure, its action. I have to make the reader feel in his bones, if nowhere else, that something is going on here that counts. The poet is traditionally a blind man, but the Christian poet and storyteller as well is like the blind man whom Christ touched, who looked then and saw men as if they were trees, but walking. This is the beginning of vision, and it is an invitation of deeper and stranger visions that we shall have to learn to accept if we want to realize a truly Christian literature. So she's referring here to the stories in the Gospels in which Jesus heals the blind man. And there's one instance in which Jesus puts his spittle into the dirt, into the sand, and he mixes it. And he takes that mixture and he puts it on the blind man's eyes. And the blind man says that he can see now, but people look like walking trees. Jesus prays over him again before he can actually see fully and clearly. But the point is that Christ heals through his touch and the restoration of vision happens in stages. And this is what Christian literature in Flannery O'Connor's style introduces to us, that we may be touched by these deep and strange visions so that we can begin to see. The universe of the Catholic fiction writer, she says, is one that is founded on the theological truths of the faith, but particularly on three of them which are basic, the fall, the redemption, and the judgment. So we see these themes developed in a very implicit and tactful way, uh, a really literarily brilliant way, reflecting on the fall, man's sinful predicament, and how Christ comes to lift us out of that condition. The Enduring Chill is narrated in the third person and begins with the main protagonist, Asbury Porter Fox. He's getting off the train in his hometown in Timberboro. Uh, he's traveling from New York, where he um, was striving to become a writer, but he's failed. And not only that, he is very sick. And he thinks that he is dying. So he's returning home to his mother's farm. And O'Connor, in this very opening scene, uses the symbolism of the sky and the sun to reflect Asbury's mood. So if you recall from the very beginning, um, the, the first setting is described in this way. The sky was a chill gray and a startling white gold sun, like some strange potentate from the east, was rising beyond the black woods that surrounded Timberboro. The reader here learns very early on in the story that Asbury feels very sorry for himself. He wallows in self-pity and he blames his failure in life on his mother. She's the cause of everything that's gone wrong in his life. He doesn't really own up to him, his own choices and the reasons for his lack of success. What kind of character is Asbury? How does he treat those around him, his mother, his sister, um, his doctor in his hometown. We find that Asbury is a very brash and sensitive, quarrelsome, kind of vain and immature young man. He's 25 years of age, but has not made anything of his life yet. And he blames his mother and he wants to punish her by uh, going home now to die. And he's going to spite his mother. He's written her a very long letter that he has brought home with him. And he wants her to open it only after he dies, because in the letter he has outlined all of his mother's faults. Asbury's train stopped so that he would get off exactly where his mother was standing, waiting to meet him. Her thin, spectacled face below him was bright with a wide smile that disappeared as she caught sight of him, bracing himself behind the conductor. The smile vanished so suddenly 
the shocked look that replaced it was so complete that he realized for the first time that he must look as ill as he was. The sky was a chill gray, and a startling white gold sun like some strange potentate from the east was rising beyond the black woods that surrounded Timberboro. It cast a strange light over the single block of one-story brick and wooden shacks. Asbury felt that he was about to witness a majestic transformation, that the flat of roofs might at any moment turn into the mounting turrets of some exotic temple for a god he didn't know. The illusion lasted only a moment before his attention was drawn back to his mother. She had given a little cry. She looked aghast. He was pleased that she should see death in his face at once. His mother, at the age of 60, was going to be introduced to reality, and he supposed that if the experience didn't kill her, it would assist her in the process of growing up. <laughs> you don't look very well, she said, and gave him a long clinical stare. I don't feel like talking, he said at once. I've had a bad trip. Mrs. Fox observed that his left eye was bloodshot, he was puffy and pale, and his hair had receded tragically for a boy of 25. The thin reddish wedge of it, left on top, bore down in a point that seemed to lengthen his nose and give him an irritable expression that matched the tone of his voice when he spoke to her. It must have been cold up there, she said. Why don't you take off your coat? It's not cold down here. You don't have to tell me what the temperature is, he said in a high voice. I'm old enough to know when I want to take my coat off. The train glided silently away behind him, leaving a view of the twin blocks of dilapidated stores. He gazed after the aluminum speck disappearing into the woods. It seemed to him that his last connection with the larger world were vanishing forever. Then he turned and faced his mother grimly, irked that he allowed himself, even for an instant, to see an imaginary temple in this collapsing country junction. He had become entirely accustomed to the thought of death but he had not become accustomed to the thought of death here. <laughs> he had felt the end coming for nearly four months, alone in his freezing flat, huddled under his two blankets and his overcoat with the three thicknesses of the New York Times between. He had had a chill one night followed by a violent sweat that had left the sheets soaking and removed all doubt from his mind about his true condition. Before this, there had been a gradual slackening of his energy and vague inconsistent aches and headaches. He had been absent so many days from his part-time job in the bookstore that he had lost it. Since then, he had been living, or just barely so, on his savings, and these diminishing day by day had been all he had between him and home. Now there was nothing. He was here. So we see that Asbury thinks he's going to die. Uh, he's been suffering for months, and this is why he's returning home and preparing for death. And he wants to have some kind of meaningful experience in his life. What does he do? So after he settles in at home, uh, he's back in his own room in his old bed, and he's laying there staring up at the ceiling. And this is important because we have the introduction of a subtle religious symbol here. So I read, when she was gone, he lay for some time staring at the water stains on the gray walls descending from the top molding. Long icicle shapes had been etched by leaks and directly over his bed on the ceiling. Another leak had made a fierce bird with spread wings. It had an icicle crosswise in its beak, and there were smaller icicles depending from its wings and tail. It had been there since his childhood, and had always irritated him, and sometimes had frightened him. He had often had the illusion that it was in motion and about to descend mysteriously and set the icicle on his head. He closed his eyes and thought, I don't have to look at it for many more days. And presently he fell asleep, or he went to sleep. So what you have introduced here is the on the ceiling right above his bed, there are water leaks in um, the molding of the ceiling, and it's taken the shape of a bird. This bird has been there, or this water leak has been there ever since his childhood days, uh, sometimes causing him irritation, sometimes causing him fright. And he imagines it's in motion, and it's going to drop the icicle on its head. Again, this is Flannery O'Connor's grotesque way, or very bizarre way, of introducing a religious symbol. The symbol of the dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, is Asbury himself Catholic? 
uh, we know he is not. We also get a glimpse into Asbury's character, according to how he reflects on his experiences in New York. And one particular experience he had was uh, his encounter with a Catholic priest, a Jesuit in particular. He met this Jesuit at a talk on uh, Buddhism in New York City, and um, Father Vogel proved to be a very sophisticated, highly educated man, and Asbury was impressed with him. Now, there's no religious connection between the two of them, uh, but uh, Asbury does look to Father Rogo as superior because he's sophisticated in his ways and in his intelligence. And so Asbury himself feels proud that before Father Vogel leaves this gathering that they were at and Father Rogo was speaking, the priest gave him his business card. So the priest took notice of him. So he was flattered. And here again, Asbury's motives are exposed. They're not really good. He's drawn to nothing more than his own self-aggrandizement, attention towards himself. He is rather vain and proud. And now, as he is at home and he's thinking about his death and ways to spite his mother, he says he suddenly comes up with this idea, and that is he wants to speak to a priest. He guilt trips his mother, saying that he's never asked her for anything, and here he is on his deathbed. So have the priest um, come to his side. And so that indeed does happen. And it's obviously not Father Rogo from New York, but rather the local Catholic priest 20 miles away, and this is Father Finn. Now, Father Finn is an interesting character in himself. Contrary to Asbury's expectation, uh, Father Finn is blind in one eye and uh, deaf in his ears. So kind of a satirical caricature of um, the figure representing the Catholic Church. And Asbury wants to have an intelligent conversation. He asks Father if he, what he thinks about James Joyce, the, the writer, and uh, Father Finn doesn't know and doesn't care. He has little patience with Asbury's kind of fake intellectualism and agnosticism. And so Father goes on to pray over him and he warns him of the dangers of being ignorant or stubborn and against God. Father Finn is rather unrefined in his ways, but he gives Asbury what he needs to hear. How can the Holy Ghost fill your soul when it's full of trash? The priest roared. The Holy Ghost will not come until you see yourself as you are, a lazy, ignorant, conceited youth, he said, pounding his fist on the little bedside table. With that noise, Mrs. Fox burst in. Enough of this, she cried. How dare you talk that way to a poor sick boy? You're upsetting him. You'll have to go. The priest continues. The poor lad doesn't even know his catechism, the priest said, rising. I should think you would have taught him to say his daily prayers. You have neglected your duty as his mother. So, very straightforward priest here. And he turns his back to the bed and said affably, I'll give you my blessing. And after this, you must say your daily prayers without fail. Whereupon he put his hand on Asbury's head and rumbled something in Latin. Call me any time, he said, and we can have another little chat. And then he followed Mrs. Fox's rigid back out. The last thing Asbury heard him say was, He's a good lad at heart, but very ignorant. So Father Finn tries to talk to him about the Holy Spirit and about saying his prayers. Asbury has nothing of this, but he is left shaken up. After Father Finn leaves, the reader sees that Asbury is described as, quote, with large childish shocked eyes, end quote, and the interaction between them torments Asbury. And he begins to think about his life. So this is grace breaking in. He begins to reflect and he sees how useless his life has been. He hasn't achieved anything. And again, he continues to think um, that he wants to blame his mother. So he does eventually give her uh, the key to uh, the drawer next to his bed where he has put the letter to spite her, the letter that describes all of the failures of his life, attributing it to her. So he's making some progress in reflecting on the truth about himself, but he hasn't arrived at the full truth. He's still very proud. So Asbury is desperate because he thinks he's going to die, and he wants to have some last meaningful experience that gives his life some purpose and meaning. 
and his attempt to have an intellectual conversation with the Jesuit priest did not give him satisfaction. So now he reminisces about meaningful experiences in the past, and he remembers Randall and Morgan, the two workers on his mother's farm. And he remembers how he worked in the dairy and had a cigarette with them one time. Now, as workers, they were not allowed to drink freely from the milk that was being produced. But he, uh, being kind of the son of the owners, um, directed them to do so, and they would resist it. They would not defy um, Mrs. Fox's orders. However, he does eventually get them to smoke a cigarette with, them, with him, and he considers this an experience of communion um, because they mutually shared uh, smoking cigarettes together. And it was to the loss of his mother because all of the milk that was produced that day was returned because it reeked of cigarette smoke. Well, now Asbury thinks, aha, I'll have one last cigarette with them and recreate that moment of communion. So he has his mother bring them to his room and Asbury hands Randall the cigarettes, and Randall simply thanks Asbury, not realizing that Asbury meant to him for him to take out just one cigarette uh, and not take the whole pack. But Asbury hadn't thought about shaking out uh, a single cigarette. He just kind of handed the whole pack to him. And he did the same thing again with Morgan. And they both thank him profusely and say, you're looking good, sir. Um, and they leave to Asbury's great disappointment. Now this disappoints Asbury greatly because he comes to realize that he's not going to have any significant moment before he dies. The idea of a significant moment for Asbury is important because it highlights to the reader the fact that Asbury is full of his own self-importance. He thinks he can make his own life meaningful. He can construct his own meaning. And again, he has failed to achieve what he wanted to achieve, just like his efforts at writing. Now, at this point of despair, the story takes a turn. So Dr. Block, the local doctor who has been tending to Asbury according to his mother's wishes and whom Asbury disdains and says, um, Dr. Block doesn't know anything and, and uh, what's wrong with me is beyond him. So he, he really chides and, and uh, is insolent to the doctor. But now finally the doctor comes back after having drawn Asbury's blood every day and he has run his tests, and he announces that actually I have great news, and that is that, Asbury, you're not going to die. Rather, you have undulant fever, and it is um, caught by drinking unpasteurized milk, in which there is bacteria. It's the same as the bangs of a cow, says Dr. Block. And of course, we as the reader know through Asbury's own reminiscing that he had indeed drunken um, unpasteurized milk when he drank the fresh milk from his mother's own milk house and tried to entice the workers to do so with him. So he is sick of his own accord. He has made himself sick. It's no one's fault. And the point is that he's not going to die. The irony here, though, is that when it becomes clear to Asbury that he's not going to die, he becomes even more disappointed. Because guess what? Now he is aware that he is going to live his life with great suffering, with the pain of undulant fever that will come and go and will plague him and make him keep him as weak and feeble as he is now. And this was all caused by his own drinking of the unpasteurized milk. So we come to the last scene, and here... Flannery O'Connor will again use the scenes of nature to describe Asbury's condition. Asbury sat up again. He turned his head almost surreptitiously to the side where the key he had given his mother was lying on the bedside table. His hand shot out and closed over it and returned it to his pocket. So he's done something here. He's kind of retracted his uh, prior spite of his mother. Okay? It's a very subtle action. He hasn't said anything but clearly something has changed in him. And he glanced across the room into the small oval-framed dresser mirror. The eyes that stared back at him were the same that, were, that had returned his gaze every day from that mirror, but it seemed to him 
that they were pallor. They looked shocked clean, as if they had been prepared for some awful vision about to come down on him. He shuddered and turned his head quickly the other way and stared out the window. What did he see? A blinding red gold sun moved serenely from under a purple cloud. Below it, the tree line was black against the crimson sun. It formed a brittle wall, standing as if it were the frail defense he had set up in his mind to protect him from what was coming. So the line of trees is the, his own self-defense, warding off the transformation that God wants of him, the transformation of grace breaking through. That is receding into the background. The blinding red gold sun moving from under the purple cloud. The boy fell back on his pillow and stared at the ceiling. His limbs that had been racked for so many weeks by fever and chill were numb now. The old life in him was exhausted. Okay, this is to say, all of his vanity, that's been exhausted. There's no room left. There's nothing left to be vain about. He can't even be proud about he's going to die a meaningful death. No, he's the cause of his own suffering. So the old life in him was exhausted. He awaited the coming of new. It was then that he felt the beginning of a chill, a chill so peculiar, so light, that it was like a warm ripple across the deeper sea of cold. So this chill that he's been experiencing, now there's a warm ripple, something new is happening, something new is breaking in. His breath became short. The fierce bird, which through the years of his childhood and the days of his illness had been poised over his head, waiting mysteriously, appeared all at once to be in motion. The image of the Holy Spirit that had always been there is now in motion. It's moving, meaning that something, there's movement within his own soul. Asbury blanched, and the last film of illusion was torn, as if by a whirlwind from his eyes. He saw that for the rest of his days, frail, racked, but enduring, he would live in the face of a purifying terror. Okay, the suffering that he is going to experience to the end of his life, it's going to be a purifying terror. A feeble cry, a last impossible protest escaped him. But the Holy Ghost, emblazoned in ice instead of fire, continued implacable to descend. Isn't that brilliant? So the point of his transformation comes with the realization that he's not going to die, but rather he is going to suffer. And the suffering is something he has brought on to himself. And yet, in a sense, in a different way, he does die. That old life that had been exhausted, it, has, it is passing. There's kind of a threefold realization of, of his inability, his death, and this inability to create meaning for himself. And now he has to take responsibility for his own life and for his own illness. Like he's at fault here. So this is the first time he's actually taking responsibility for himself rather than blaming his mother and his sister. And the reality, the truth of this lifelong suffering ahead of him, it shatters all of his um, absorbed, self-obsessed perspective that he has of himself and of the world. Like he's the center of the universe. And he does give out that little feeble cry, this last impossible protest. But the Holy Spirit is moving. It's moving in his heart. And through this painful experience, this is grace breaking open. This is the point of his transformation. So this closing scene has been likened to kind of a personal Pentecostal event in which Asbury's own self-reliance, his self-righteousness is destroyed and is re reborn by this terrifying, purifying terror, okay, by the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. What is going to be meaningful in his life is not so much what he can gain or construct for himself by his own human strength and ingenuity, but rather by the grace of God working within him. In the same way that the Spirit comes upon the twelve apostles and something new is established, there is a new creation, the kingdom of God is established. Human strength alone cannot give our lives meaning. Our own efforts do not save us. In Asbury's melodramatic attempts to manipulate his own life and death, 
end in complete failure. But the whole time that uh, water stain of the Holy Spirit is there, meaning God has never given up on him. God has been waiting for the right time to give him this grace in whatever circumstance he finds himself in because he has made particular choices in his life. So we return to the slide on the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does within our lives. He is the Spirit of God, the bond of love between the Father and the Son, the gift of God himself. He is the advocate, the one who, who advocates for us, who speaks on our behalf, illumines and guides us. Right, The Spirit renews and defends. He consoles us in our suffering. He heals us in our wounds and weaknesses. And he makes us holy. He sanctifies in order to transform us, to make us true sons and daughters of God. But in order for the Spirit to do this, there is a fundamental work. And it is about the conviction of sin. We read of this in John 16. When Jesus says, but I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and condemnation. He okay, sin because they do not believe in me. In order for God's grace to take root in us, we must first recognize that we are sinners. We cannot save ourselves. We are helpless, and we need to rely on God's grace. So this conviction of sin is what Asbury has experienced, and it's the beginning of his transformation. This conviction of sin is a real judgment. Now, society sometimes presents to us false values. It says that it is wrong to ever judge anyone. Let people be and do what they wish. But if we look at the life of Jesus Christ, did he ever judge? Yes, he did. But his judgment was a judgment without condemnation. His judgment was a reckoning with the truth. So think of the wo woman caught in adultery. Indeed, she was committing adultery. And according to the law, she deserved punishment. So the scribes and Pharisees drag her throw her at the feet of Jesus, and ask him to judge. And does he judge? He does indeed judge. He doesn't say, oh, woman, uh, no worries, you know, uh, like, you're not going to believe it, but in the 21st century, hookup culture is the norm, so what you're doing is perfectly fine. You're just way ahead of your time. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Rather, he speaks the truth, and this truth is, woman, you have defiled yourself. But his judgment, being a judgment of truth, is not a judgment that wants to um, kill her, to punish her, to stone her to death, and to delight in seeing her suffer. Rather, his judgment is a judgment that gives life. So it's said that Jesus, rather than answering um, those who are condemning, accusing this woman, rather than answering them directly, he bent down and started writing in the sand. And the church fathers will say, it is likely, what was he writing? Because the effect of it is that as he writes, all of the men begin to walk away. They no longer accuse her. Jesus, who knew the heart of man, was probably writing the sins of, of all of these other persons who were condemning this woman, who she too is a sinner, but a sinner des deserving of God's mercy. And so he extends that mercy to her and enables her to refashion her life. The same thing happens at the well of Jacob, where Jesus at the noon of day is sitting there while the apostles go and um, get some food for lunch. And while he's there, strangely enough, a Samaritan woman comes to get water. Now, the fact that she's there at the noon of day says that she is avoiding um, the women who would typically be getting their water at another time of the day when the sun was not uh, beating down on their heads because she was the uh, topic of their gossip. Jesus sees the truth about her and he speaks the truth. He tells her, um, you, you have five husbands and none of them are actually your husband. So he speaks the truth to her in a way that gives her hope gives her new life, and she believes. And guess what? This, this shamed woman, she actually courageously runs into the city and proclaims to 
the people in the marketplace said, I have met the Messiah. Come and, and meet him. He speaks the truth, right? That's great transformation. So it's not about not judging, but it's about judgment according to the truth. A judgment of mercy, not of condemnation. Now, I've given two examples of two women. How about a man? Think of this man. Do you recognize the scene? Jesus is in the background there. His arms, his hands are tied behind him. So this is uh, the beginning of his captivity and his passion will begin. Well, here we have Peter. He's in the forefront. And this is the moment of Peter's denial of Jesus. He's fearful for his own life. He doesn't know what will happen to his teacher and master and what will subsequently happen to him. And so when asked by a mere maiden, aren't you one of the Galileans? Aren't you a part of his group too? Peter shamefully denies Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He looks at Peter and conveys through his eyes. He conveys his mercy and forgiveness. He does not condemn Peter. Look, I've been with you all this time. And I've given my life to you. I've, I've given you my teaching. And you can't even speak the truth to a, a mere servant girl. So Jesus doesn't take that judgment of condemnation. Rather, he looks at Peter with love. That's the judgment of mercy. Because we are all in need of God's mercy. We are all in need of grace. And God offers it. That is the role of the Holy Spirit. To sanctify. And that sanctification happens by, firstly, our recognition of our own sinfulness. And because we know that we are sinners, we now cry out for redemption. We cry out for the mercy of God. So indeed, that Holy Spirit emblazoned in fire and in ice is constantly descending upon us. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. He is given to us. He is God's divine gift to us. The Spirit dwells within us. We are the temples of the Spirit if we welcome him into our lives. We have a God of great love and mercy, a God who is Trinitarian, and in the essence of the Trinity, we discover the great mercy and love of God. Laudetus Jesus Christus, in secula seculorum. Amen.